Hi everybody, I'm Rick Hansen for the Foundations of Wellbeing program, here with Gretchen Rubin for the Pillar of Gratitude. And uh, uh, if I may call you Gretchen, uh, yeah. anyone who's graduated from Yale Law School and clerked for Sandra Day O'Connor, I, I want to be careful in how I address her, but anyway, um, Gretchen uh, is a graduate of both Yale University and Yale Law School. She did clerk for a Supreme Court Justice. And along the way, she uh, began to focus increasingly on being a writer and has produced two runaway bestsellers that have sold over a million copies worldwide. Uh, the Happiness Project, which you've probably heard about, as well as Happier at Home. So now using this as kind of an entree into your book, The Happiness Project, uh, I wondered if you could share with us, you know, your, your top five, your top 10, something like that, your keepers, your tips, your suggestions for, okay, what are those things that really make a difference for people? Um, I think we flagged one already, you know, do what you love, um, yes. et cetera. Uh, do you have a few others for us that you found either in your own life or reading, going deep into the literature or the wisdom about happiness? Yeah, I think if you said, like, what is the secret to happiness? Like, what, you know, what's at the top of the list? There's a couple of different answers that you could give depending on the framework that you use to approach the question. But certainly one answer and, and probably the best answer, and ancient philosophers and contemporary scientists agree on this, is relationships. And that to be happy, we really need enduring, intimate long-term bonds with other people. And so anything that you do that either deepens your relationships with people or broadens your relationships with people is probably something that's going to make you happier. And then there's a million things that can fall from, follow from that. So it's like you could join or start a group. I've joined or started like 11 groups since I started my happiness project. And they are all such an engine of happiness for me. Um, you could, you know, push yourself to show up. So, you know, somebody's having a, a party, like, and you don't quite feel like going, well, really, you know, say, I think in the end, I probably will be happier if I go or, oh, you know, I'm going to make that effort to go to that reunion or to go to that wedding, even though it seems like it's going to be a little bit of a pain to like deal with the logistics. And so anything, um, you know, I have a, one of my resolutions is to kiss my husband every morning and every night. Cause it's like, for me, if it's not on the calendar, it might not get done. So I'm like, put that on the calendar. So there's so many things that you can do if you're saying, okay, well, how can I strengthen or deepen my relationships? Um, so that one is relationships and everything that would follow. And then there's another way to answer it. Gretchen, oh, part, yeah. may I interject just yes, I, sure. before we go on to the, in addition to relationships factors, I just wanted to kind of dive into two things that I think might be in people's minds. So some people do talk about uh, feeling drained by pushing themselves into relationships. And so I just want to acknowledge that and also acknowledge the underlying implicit important point that I know you recognize about diversity. They're just different ways. There are individual differences. Oh, yeah. And yeah. yeah. And I so mean, one person wants to have coffee with a, a friend in a quiet coffee shop and another one person wants to go to a crowded cocktail party. Um, and so you, you're exactly right. Like with everything, and that's going to bring me to my next point, you really have to think about, well, what's true for you? The fact is just about everyone needs strong relationships, but the form of engagement is very dependent on the kind of person that you are and what you find energizing and restorative. And most people, you know, need to really think about, well, is this really going to, um, is this going to help me? But if, but if it's like, should I stay home on the couch and watch reruns or should I call a friend? Probably connecting with that friend is the thing that's going to, but, but you need to decide what is the form of connection that is really going to give me that happiness boost. You're absolutely right. It really depends. Right. And also, I think for some people, sitting on that couch doing whatever they're doing would actually be more restorative than spending time with their friend. Well, I think that there's a difference between restorative solitude and meaningless uh, just downtime. And I think that most people kind of know the difference of like, are you quietly doing the things that restore you or are you just so drained that you're doing? And there's I call it the bad trance. The bad trance is 
flipping channels on the TV, click, 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 clicking on the internet, um, on, you know, flipping through catalogs. My thing is like, I often will reread a magazine that I've already read. Like, why am I, because I just kind of can't switch gears to do something that is going to refresh me more, yeah. that's going to be a little bit more demanding to get into it. So I think you're absolutely right. It's very important to know what is restorative solitude, which I need tons of restorative solitude. And I think a lot of people are starved for solitude. I talk to so many people. I'm like, I think you need to take, they're like, oh, I work so hard. I feel like every minute that I have, I need to be with my family. I'm like, you know what? You might need to have several hours like to yourself. Like people, if they need that, they need that. You've got to build that into your life in some way. But just like staying up late and, you know, watching reality TV reruns. I mean, you know, it, it, so it is, it's like, really think about it, really think about what is it that you need and are you doing the things that are going to get you that boost? Right. Draining solitude in contrast to restorative yes. solitude. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I wondered if you had any other uh, kind of major headlines related to the happiness project and then we'll go on to your next book. Well, see, this is a thing which sounds so trivial, um, but I have to mention it because it's so surprised. It's, it, it, continually surprises me and it seems to be something that is very powerful for many people and that is the degree to which for most people outer order contributes to inner calm and inner self-command now i completely agree that something like a crowded coat closet or an overflowing in basket is trivial when you're thinking about the context of a happy life clearly that is true and yet over and over people say to me and i have felt this myself that if you get control over the stuff of life, you feel more in control of your life generally. And if it's an illusion, it's a helpful illusion. And people talk about being feeling both energized and calmed, like it works in both directions. They feel more creative. It's sort of like when you can see surfaces, when you can put things away, when you can find things, it, like it opens up your mind and it gives you this huge boost. People often will say to me like, oh, I got rid of like all these bags of stuff and I see, feel so much freer. A friend of mine told me, she said, I cleaned out my fridge and now I know I can switch careers. <laughs> and I knew exactly what, what she meant. And so I think if you're feeling drained and overwhelmed, sometimes like it's, because it, it, it's also very specific, like it's not an abstract thing. It's a very clear external thing that you can do. Um, and so I have a lot of resolutions aimed at keeping maintaining clutter the, and the number one resolution since i've written the happiness project whenever people say they've done things for their own happiness i always say oh you know what did you try what worked for you and the number one specific thing that people mention and again it's not the most significant thing you can do but it seems to be like a gateway thing to do is to make your bed so many people specifically mention making their bed as something that makes them happier generally um, and another thing that people often mention to me is something that really happened, helped them, is the one-minute rule. Anything that you can do in less than a minute, you do without delay, as it comes up. If you can go to the mail and rip open a letter, read it, and throw it away. If you can print out a document and file it. If you can hang up your coat. If you can you know, bang out a one-word answer to an email. And that keeps all those little tasks from piling up because when they pile up, they make us feel drained and overwhelmed and like we don't we can't tackle the big things. They're not really in our way, but they feel like they're in our way. And when we get when we get rid of all that underbrush, then we can tackle the big things in our lives that are really going to give us that powerful sense of satisfaction. I think that's fantastic. And, you know, I'm uh, you're preaching to get there to the choir as well. Uh, you, you even though my office has a certain fullness to it, it's orderly and I can see behind you. Your office is the same way and there's a term in psychology you may know it's stimulus bound and it's the idea that we have all these stimuli around us and if we have a physically cluttered space attention is just going to be bound to all those little things which is going to reduce cognitive resources just to put it a certain way for other things including cognitive resources for your own well-being your own happiness right. so that's good now, I do think like your office is a, is a good example. Some people like being in abundant spaces. They like a lot of they like a lot of of uh, like fullness and richness to their spaces. And then other people like want bare walls, bare, bare. But and that's but that's a distinct thing from mess, which yep. is like I don't know where it is. I think I should throw this away. I don't remember what this is for. You know those things. That that's not a beautiful you know montage of of photographs on the wall, which is really pleasing. It's just things feeling like they're just floating around um, uncontrolled. And so I think yeah, it's it's really true. There's a big connection there. That's great. Um, 
Well, last call on any other major headlines from uh, the Happiness Project. I mean, this particular one kind of relates to where we're going, which is the idea of, you know, happier at home, uh, right. what you can do in your in your home environments. But I just wondered before we leave here, if you had any other uh, kind of like major wisdom headlines from the Happiness Project. Well, I mean, you you raised it right right uh, right at the beginning, which is this idea of gratitude. And And the thing about gratitude is that it's... It's hard to maintain a sense of gratitude for all the things that you have. It's so much easier to notice what you don't have. So something like health or something like money, they, they weigh us down much more than they lift us up because we're very aware of when we don't have them. But then once we do have them, we take them for granted. And so I think that it's very true that you need to have some kind of intentional practice to remind yourself of like, you know, I always think of like the beauty of the ordinary day, you know, of just like everything that I take for granted and how precious it is and how one day I'll look back. I mean, I remember having the thought like because I had a stroll. I live in an apartment. So our stroller was right there and by our front door. It drove me crazy. It was just like so, you know, looked out of place, but there was no place to put it. And I remember thinking to myself, one day I will look back with longing at the day when I had a stroller there. And that day has come, you know, and so I think to have these, like one thing I do, because I live in an apartment building and I have to use, there's sort of double doors that you have to go through, is I think every time I come and go, I use that as an opportunity to think, oh, how happy I am to be coming home or how happy I am to be going out into New York City, which is my favorite place in the world. And so these reminders. And the other thing about gratitude that's really handy, um, especially if you're facing a tricky situation, is that gratitude drives out emotions like anger and resentment and annoyance. And so if there's somebody in your life who you're, is really bugging you, if you can take a second, and again, it takes a lot of intention, you have to remember to do it. If you can take a minute and think, what am I grateful for to this person for? I mean, maybe she's really annoying me, but she's a great grandmother. Or maybe this person's really annoying me, but on the other hand, they're totally reliable. And every Friday I have that report on my desk so that I never have to like give it a second thought. And when you when you find that way to be great, grateful, then those other feelings, it's not like you're pretending that they're not true, but they seem, they dissipate, they seem less important. So gratitude just... It's, it's, but it's, it, it, it takes cultivation because it's so easy just to like focus on the negative. That's the negativity bias and forget all the things that you have to be grateful for. So Gretchen, again, I'd like to express my gratitude uh, to you personally for taking the time here and my respect for what you've accomplished and investigated as well uh, for your own sake, for sure. But with benefits that have rippled out and touched, I think the lives of millions of people, no small thing. Thank you. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you. That's great. Good. Thank you.